Okay, we're going to now move into an area dealing with the liability of law enforcement agencies with their field operations, what they're doing out there on a day-to-day -day basis out there in the field. And we're going to start with our conversation with excessive use of force and what that means and how that's measured. Then we'll move into other types of enforcement activities used by law enforcement agencies that can expose them to liability if it's not conducted properly. Now, the constitutional standard that applies to excessive use of force depends on if the person is an arrestee or if the person's a pretrial detainee or is a person who is an ins already an, a sentenced inmate. Many cases, and the ones that usually make the news, are the ones dealing with de arrestees. Arrestees are those individuals out there in the public and the police try to apprehend. The police come about, interface, and suddenly there is an issue and force is needed to arrest the individual or to detain the individual. The Fourth Amendment applies. The reasonableness standard applies to those types of interactions. The focus will be on the police officer's conduct. Was it reasonable or unreasonable, given the totality of the circumstances? The 14th Amendment applies to those individuals who are detainees already. Maybe they're awaiting trial, uh, or they're already arrested in police custody. And finally, the Eighth Amendment applies to those inmates who are in jail, are already under the government authority. And the Eighth Amendment deals with the cruel and unusual punishment standard. We're actually, in this particular conversation, going to concentrate on the Fourth Amendment because we're dealing with field operations. But there's different amendments that apply to the different statuses of the individual or the suspect or the inmate. Now let's start our review with some very important cases. Tennessee versus Garner. Garner, this is one of the most famous cases that really sets the case precedent for use of force, and it was decided by the Supreme Court in 1985. Ultimately, the court held that deadly force may not be used unless it is necessary to prevent the escape, and the officer has probable cause to believe the suspect poses a significant threat of death or serious physical injury to the officers or others. Garner case established a key legal parameter on the use of deadly force. It actually was a case where a Memphis police officer shot and killed an unarmed 15-year-old who was fleeing the scene of a burglary. While investigating a call from a neighbor, the officer had walked behind the unoccupied house and spotted the child climbing a chain link fence. The officer called out to the child to stop. When he did not, the officer shot him in the back of the head. Although it was dark outside. The officer admitted that he had no reason to believe the decedent, that means the, the juvenile, was armed or dangerous and explained that his reason for firing was that the defendant had would have escaped and very likely would not have been apprehended. The officer's actions were thought justifiable under the existing state flea and felon statute that authorized the police to use deadly force to prevent escape of felony suspects. States often have these flea and felon type statutes that really authorize the use of force if it's a felony being committed and there's a flea and felon going from the scene. While the estate was opened up, uh, Garner's father, the juvenile's father, filed suit and alleged different violations of the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 8th and 14th Amendments. Well, in that particular case, the Supreme Court 
adopted the position that it would be the Fourth Amendment that applies. And in Garner, that court introduced a new standard. It's like a balancing test, like most legal standards we encounter. But it's a balancing test for determining liability. The balancing test requires a court to balance the nature of the intrusion on the individual's Fourth Amendment interest against governmental interests alleged to justify that intrusion. So that particular case was a very, very important case because it finally clarified which amendment dealt with arrestees. And it was clear from that point forward which amendment would apply in field operations. So what constitutes excessive force is a matter based on judicial interpretation. Often you hear that if an, for an act to constitute excessive force, it has to result in a serious injury. And that's not true. There has been a U.S. Supreme Court case that says, no, that's not the right measurement for when excessive force occurs. Note, a police officer who uses reasonable and necessary amount of force to, af to effect a illegal arrest, not a legal arrest, but an illegal arrest, has used excessive force per se, per a U.S. Supreme Court case in 1998 called Atkins versus New York. So if the officer is using any force um, and is actually making an illegal arrest, that's excessive use of force by its very nature. Now, after the Garner decision came another very important decision called Graham versus Connor. And Graham versus Connor built on the Garner decision, kind of continued forward analyzing this concept of excessive force. And the Supreme Court once again was confronted with a situation of possible except excessive force. In this particular 1989 Supreme Court case, the justices held that when engaged in situations where the use of force is necessary, a law enforcement officer must act as other reasonable officers would have acted in a similar tense rapidly evolving situation. This is known as the reasonable person standard being applied to these types of claims. Again, the Fourth Amendment would apply. And again, in the Graham decision, the U.S. Supreme Court said it would be a careful balancing test used of the nature and quality of the intrusion meaning the degree of force and its effect on the individual, against the countervailing governmental interest at stake, in light of the totality of the circumstances. And a famous quote that came out of this case that's often used in other cases, the Supreme Court justices in the Graham case announced that we analyze this question from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight. Another important quote from this case is we, we thus allow for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving about the amount of force that is necessary in a particular situation. So from these quotes, we can glean that the Supreme Court justices were very sympathetic to officers in the field. They didn't feel comfortable second-guessing officers later down the road. So in light of these, there were three factors to, be, to consider that the U.S. Supreme Court basically announced. First of all, the totality of the circumstances. Don't just look at one criteria or one fact. The whole circumstances surrounding the encounter must be taken in consideration. Force should be judged by a reasonable standard. 
in that reasonableness standard and whether a reasonable police officer with the same training and experience faced a similar situation would do the same. Now, these all reared their heads in the uh, Ferguson case, Michael Brown case. That case really had repercussions throughout the criminal justice system and especially use of force. And the totality of the circumstances weren't, wasn't just an unarmed black teenager, but the circumstances were what that teenager first did before the encounter even occurred. And that was a strong arm robbery of a convenience store. And then the conduct of of that individual when he was approached by the police officer in the vehicle itself and what transpired there and also the size of the individual he was a very large youth and so lots of things came into play that's considered the totality of the circumstances that's what we look at You often hear of the Graham factors. This is what we learned from the Graham decision. The reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene, and its calculus must embody an allowance for the fact that police officers are often forced with, to make split-second decisions about the amount of force necessary in a particular situation. So the Supreme Court instructed courts to always ask several questions when judging police use of excessive force. So the Graham decision really kind of gave a roadmap to other lower courts on what to do, how to handle these accusations in court. And here are three questions they should ask. What was the severity of the crime that the officer believed the suspect had committed? Did the suspect present an imminent threat to the safety of officers or the public? Was the suspect actively resisting arrest or attempting to escape. These were considered and still are the Graham factors. Again, each case is really decided on a case-by-case, -case, factually intensive type review because no case is going to be identical. So courts will look at the totality of the circumstances. When trying to sit in judgment, and that's a hard thing to do, is sit in judgment to determine is there excessive use of force. One great way, I think, and I think everybody would agree, to control this area of liability to law enforcement agencies is to provide less than lethal alternatives. Equip the officers and deputies, road patrols, motor units, front line in the streets officers with tools and training of course to use those tools that are less than lethal for example stun guns and tasers those are considered less than lethal now deaths can arise under certain circumstances so this list doesn't mean that they won't kill but they surely are less than lethal than a bullet or a round of bullets. Stun guns and tasers, very controversial, but they are have been adopted and in use for many years now. They're considered less than lethal. My advice when using stun guns and tasers is make sure that you order and use the device that has automatic video and audio recording that is triggered when the unit is taken out of the holster and a playback feature so that way everything is documented it's very helpful in accusations of excessive use of force and also uses confetti style tracers what I mean by that is if there's a discharge of the probes lots of little confetti hits the ground to track which taser shot out where. That's also very useful. Make sure that these tasers and stun guns are carried on the opposite side of the firearm on the user's holster or belt holster area. So that way there's no confusion of which one's being drawn. And the handle should be bright yellow or 
bright red or something that would stand out at night, alerting the officer to the fact that this is the less than lethal instrument and not their revolver or service issued gun. Beanbag non-lethal rounds and often used uh, by police officers and, and those are typically uh, encouraged. Lateral vascular maneuver, maneuver, LMV, LVM, I'm sorry. Um, and that is a particular maneuver where it isn't a chokehold. Chokeholds are illegal. They're considered basically excessive force. LVMs are when officers cut the blood flow through a neck restraint to the brain. The suspect loses consciousness and then the release of the hold allows the blood to flow up the arteries back into the brain. So it's a temporary unconsciousness. Dangerous. And in fact, I would tell you about 50% of the, of the police forces ban this maneuver because it is putting somebody in a coma purposefully, and if not applied properly, could have dangerous and detrimental effects. Plus, this hands-on type uh, alternative could result to injuries in the officer as well. So the lateral vascular maneuver is really uh, frowned upon by big law departments law enforcement departments. I know that our department is struggling with this. Uh, about 10 years ago, they banned it. Now there's a movement to bring it back. But generally, legal advisors advise law enforcement agencies not to use this particular maneuver. If you have other means, batons, stun guns, bean bags, pepper spray, to secure compliance. And, I, and I'm kind of of the thought as well that the LVM should really be retired. Uh, it's great to use it in wrestling, and of course, wrestling is fake on TV. They always use it, but I don't think it's probably the best maneuver uh, to use in the field. Batons, pepper sprays, canines are all considered less than lethal type uses of force. However, the application of anything less than lethal force or device should be managed and monitored the same way as if force could cause serious injury or death. So these are some tips on how to kind of avoid the excessive use of force liability. Now let's turn our focus to high-speed chases. Uh, that again is a version of use of force. It's not a direct use of force, a physical use of force of the officer on a suspect. But high-speed chases often rear their heads, and they are, they are analyzed under the Fourth Amendment as well. In 2014, the Plumhoff case from the Supreme Court reaffirmed, again, the Fourth Amendment is the measuring tool for arrestees in those situations as to allegations of excessive use of force. And this Fourth Amendment did not prohibit police from using deadly force that they employed to terminate the dangerous car chase that they faced. And the particular officers were also entitled to qualified immunity for the conduct at issue because they violated no clearly established law. We talked about qualified immunity before, uh, and that is afforded to law enforcement officers and their conduct. In this particular case, there was a vehicle chase. The police were chasing a vehicle that exceeded over 100 miles per hour and lasted for over five minutes. During the chase, the defendant, the decedent now, Rickard, passed more than two dozen other vehicles, several of which were forced to alter courses. Richard's outrageous, Rickard's outrageous, reckless driving posed a grave public safety risk. And eventually, the police cornered the driver in a parking lot. And the police got out of the car. They drew, they drew their weapons. And then the vehicle was pinned between two units, I believe, two uh, police vehicles. 
The driver did not cease. He kept spinning his wheels, gunning the engine, trying to get loose from the uh, two vehicles. And so the police opened fire, and they fired many shots, at least 15, as I remember, probably more. Um, so he was not giving up. And in fact, there was a chance he was going to escape from that parking lot because he actually did maneuver his vehicle and pushed one of the units aside and it start and he started to move throughout that parking lot. Well ultimately the again the officers discharged their weapons and killed both the driver and the passenger. It was obvious from the facts that the accelerator accelerator was being pushed down by the driver in an attempt to escape. And the off and and the Supreme Court said yes even though technically you may argue the chase had ended, it was going to recommence. And there, and there was going to be a grave public danger and danger to the officers. Uh, so their discharge of the weapons into the vehicle was justified and it was not excessive force. Also, the Supreme Court said that the officers were protected under qualified immunity principles. Now, use of force in the field, most, and you probably are aware of this, most police departments rely on use of force continuums. However, there's been a movement away from those and more of an objection, objectively reasonableness standard in light of the totality of the circumstances. So this use of force continuum is really a sliding scale, an escalating scale, if you will. Some departments have it featured on a chart or on a like a column with different color codes uh, and the more serious and more severe type um, forceful responses are used for the more serious threats. At the low end, the continuum consists of oral direction and calm, non-threatening commands such as let me see your license and registration or stop. That's at the very, very low end of the use of force. It is a use of force because it's a command and the subject is conforming to uh, directions. However, at the very, you know, at the top, as you might imagine, the continuum increases to include soft techniques such as grabbing or holding a suspect to pain compliant techniques such as chokeholds and ultimately guns as a means of lethal force. When you use that phrase chokeholds, it is a loaded term. So I would try not to be using that in your uh, training materials. And if you have, if you allow it, the lateral vascular maneuver. Courts have also recognized that there can be duties owed during the use of force. Courts also recognize that the proper balancing test between the officers aim for maximum effectiveness in stopping a suspect while creating minimal danger to innocent bystanders is always in play. There's always those um, uh, scales of justice, if you will, weighing those two interests. Once the individual has been stopped, the officer should render appropriate first aid when possible. So once the suspect is contained and is arrested, uh, then the officer should call for medical um, services from the fire rescue or ambulance uh, detail and also render that assistance themselves if it's serious. Deadly force is not considered an excessive use of force when it is used by police as a means of preventing serious threats to public's well-being. So again, if it's a threat to the public, not and maybe not to the officer, but to the public, excessive use of force can be justified. Lawsuits alleging the use of excessive force in, in federal court systems often are filed under 1983 actions. We talked about 1983 actions, 42 U.S.C. 1983, and their civil rights violation allegations. They must allege color of law, meaning the officer acted on duty under the guise, under the authority of the agency. And allege, the, the, the plaintiff must allege a deliberate indifference, violating a constitutional right. Remember, the 4th, 14th, and 8th Amendments tend to apply to these excessive use of forces. 
uh, depending on the status of the uh, individual claiming excessive use of force at the time. Lawsuits alleging the use of excessive force in state court systems are often filed under the tort, intentional tort theories, such as assault, battery. Those are your intentional torts that are used in the state court system. Now, there is a difference between state excessive use of force versus battery claims. Excessive use of force and battery claims are not identical. Battery, the plaintiff must show by preponderance of the evidence the intent to cause bodily harm, whereas excessive force is based on the objective reasonableness standard of the officer's conduct without regard to his intent or motivation. So there is a subtle difference there when you look at it, when you analyze battery versus excessive force. There's indirect excessive force as well. That's when there's no physical contact, but maybe pit maneuvers uh, by fleeing uh, suspects in vehicles and the officers use their vehicles to uh, end the chase through a maneuver, if you will, of causing the suspect's car to get to go out of control and crash if you will vehicular roadblocks that's also uh excessive well i can't say excessive use of force but it could be excessive use of force depending on when they're implemented and how they're implemented there are liabilities for indirect excessive use of force now turning our attention to high-risk drug enforcement operations. Kind of the militarization in, of law enforcement, drug raids, and SWAT teams. There's a heightened level of liability here. The Fourth Amendment reasonableness standard does apply. But before these particular operations take place, you should secure a warrant if it's practical. It greatly reduces civil liability exposure in these types of cases. If the police exceed their authority in using excessive force during these operations and they conduct intrusive searches that aren't allowed under the warrant, they go beyond the warrant's parameters and or confiscate personal property that's not evidentiary in nature that, and that does not prove any type of criminality. There could be civil liability against the agency and the officers. So how do you avoid actions, whether it's negligence or other types of actions in these drug raids, these high risk enforcement operations? Well, to answer that, we have to revisit the elements of negligence. That's one of the primary tort actions. It's a non-intentional tort against the officers and their agents, agencies. Remember, negligence has four elements, duty, breach, causation, damages. A duty is owed to the suspect. The breach occurred uh, of that duty by the officer. Causation, either proximate or actual. It satisfies that element and damages occur to the uh, plaintiff or the suspect. To help control the risk in these types of operations, plan carefully the operation. Obtain a warrant, as I had mentioned. Use experienced and well-trained officers and conduct surveillance before doing it so that you know when is the best time for the operation to be launched to not only secure the suspects, but also less chance of injury to innocent people in the area. For example, you probably don't want to commit a drug raid operation on a school day across the street from a school right when the school is getting out kids are on the on the sidewalks walking home not wise i think that we would all agree so there are several ways to control these risks 
but these high risk enforcement operations, and generally we're talking about drug enforcement operations, carry a lot of baggage, expose the agency to liability. But you can't be paralyzed. You got to conduct them. You got to fight crime. You can't be paralyzed by the threat of litigation. But you can manage that threat. You can manage that liability effectively. An interesting case came out of Florida and went to the Supreme Court in 2013. And it's actually a Miami-Dade Police Department. Had an anonymous tip that a house was a grow house down in Miami-Dade County. And the Miami-Dade uh, police officers, other than this purely anonymous tip, uh, didn't have any other evidence whatsoever. So what they decided to do was when the house was vacant, they had surveillance on the house, they used a canine and brought the canine up to the porch area and sniffed under the door of the house. And there was a hit. The canine alerted to a hit, and then they went back and got a warrant. Came back, raided it, and it was a drug house. Well, the Supreme Court said, whoa, 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 wait. You can't do that. You have to have more probable cause. It's considered a search. Drug sniffing is a search, especially when you bring it up to somebody's house, somebody's patio area, and sniffing under the door. That's not what normal people do. That's intrusive. And therefore, the Fourth Amendment applied. So in other words, before the officers had brought the dog on premises, they should have got a warrant. And there wasn't enough evidence at that time to get the warrant. So keep in mind, uh, you can't use the drug sniff results just to establish probable cause for a warrant. You have to have more. And that's what that case was all about. Interesting case. Interesting case. Now, there's a whole, we have a, a whole discussion whole chapter on failure to protect citizens in police operations on the roadways. Now, if you recall, we talked about the public duty doctrine. The public duty doctrine was derived from common law. The public duty doctrine held that police had no duty to protect the general public from harm, absent a special relationship. This stem from the principle that police officers protect the general public, not specific individuals. So this ties into that negligence tort claim. Remember that first element of negligence is duty, a legal duty owed. And under the public duty doctrine, courts have said, no, 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 we aren't going to extend that general duty element to everybody in, in society. Just because the police are out there on the street, they owe a duty to everybody and to protect the interest. They can't. Today, the courts hold that where a duty is owed to the general public and not to a particular person, there can exist no cause of action or subsequent liability for failure to protect individuals from injuries caused by a third party. So in other words, uh, the police are not liable because of injuries to third parties, to citizens uh, out there, generally speaking. There is no absolute guarantee that police operations can protect every member of the public. That's the bottom line. Generally, police are not liable for, cr for criminal victimizations of citizens because of the public duty doctrine, as we talked about. However, there are some theories, there are some times when the liability does exist between the police officer and his or her employer, the agency, and third-party victims. This whole conversation is about third-party victimizations. Those parties who are not the suspects, they're not the criminals, but they were involved in the situation. What kind of liability does the law enforcement officer have to those individuals, the bystanders, if you will? Generally, no public duty exists for a lawsuit to be based upon against the officer. However, in certain circumstances, there are. Under the abandonment theories, the, the abandonment of victims are the public by police. These theories allow third parties to sue, then, the police officer and his or her agency, because there is a duty to protect the third parties now, legally. 
Now, again, we're talking about legal duties, ethically and moral duties exist out there, but we're talking about the legal duties. For example, young children in a violent situation, there's a legal duty. The officers should act to try to protect them. Intoxicated or mentally incapacitated victims or third party are bystanders. There generally may be a, a legal duty owed to them. Victims of spousal abuse. If police officers or law enforcement officers show up at a domestic, they're under an obligation not only to defuse the situation, but then not remove one of the occupants, at least for 24 hours, get them off premises. Because maybe the female is in fear of her life or the male's in fear of their life. And if the police officers leave and just leave both parties in the house or in the structure, more harm than good can occur then. If there's prior assurances of protection given but not carried out by police, there's liability for third-party victimizations. Police should direct law enforcement officers to refer individuals to public or private resources such as religious, medical, or social service uh, systems and support systems like homeless shelters for the programs. In other words, when you leave a scene, always try to provide to a third party victim at least some roadway, some avenue for additional help, a referral pamphlet, or if it's the homeless, maybe bringing them to a homeless shelter. These are ways to immunize or avoid third party victimizations later. those types of claims against officers. Okay, that'll do it for our general discussion in this area of liability. And remember, you can never, never, never control all liability. As a police officer, as a law enforcement agency, your job is to get out there in the streets, prevent crime. And it's it, it's a, a very difficult job, to say the least. You're walking a tightrope. And you're going to have to assert force to some degree. And there's no way to control all scenarios. So this is a delicate balancing. And the courts recognize that. They balance the interests involved and that reasonableness standard and reflection on the totality of the circumstances is really uh, how they evaluate these claims.